Welcome to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today's topic is 3.3, Conservation and Regeneration. We're going to examine the standard level content about conservation strategies and the design principles for establishing protected areas. Let's get into it. Conservation and regeneration represent two complementary approaches to biodiversity protection. Conservation focuses on preserving what already exists, while regeneration aims to restore what's been damaged or lost. Both of these are important parts of environmental management in a changing world. Let's begin by exploring the various arguments used to justify species and habitat preservation. We're going to go through these one by one in just a moment. The arguments can be categorized into five main types. Aesthetic, ecological, economic, ethical, and social justifications. Each perspective offers important insights into why biodiversity matters. Economic arguments for preservation frequently involve the valuation of ecotourism, genetic resources, and natural capital. Different ecosystems provide distinct ecological services, and that influences their economic value to society. The chart shown here illustrates the enormous value of ecosystem services across various biomes globally, from forests, to wetlands and coral reefs. Here's a concrete example of economic justification for conservation from Cambodia. Cambodia's deciduous forests are vital conservation areas in Southeast Asia, and they have really diverse mammal and bird life, but they face threats from deforestation, hunting, and settlement. In 2002, the Cambodian government partnered with a wildlife conservation society to implement payment for ecosystem services schemes. These are called PES schemes. These programs charge tourists for birdwatching experiences and they pay locals for reporting and protecting threatened species nests. Some communities also participate in the UN Red Plus program in which they receive financial payments to protect forests. Keeping the forest intact not only provides habitat for biodiversity, it also sequesters carbon to mitigate climate change. These kinds of PES schemes create economic incentives for conservation while supporting local communities. Similarly, tourism offers compelling economic reasons for conservation in East Africa. The region generates over $7 billion a year from tourism across countries like Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. Mountain ecosystems featuring trekking, wildlife viewing, and scenic landscapes are major attractions, with Mount Kilimanjaro alone providing more than a third of Tanzania's tourism revenue. In rural areas with limited agricultural options, conservation-based tourism offers really important income source through crafts, guiding, and employment in the hospitality industry. This shows how protecting natural environments can directly benefit local economies and communities. Ecological reasons for conservation often relate to ecosystem services. Pollination is a prime example of this. Insects help crop reproduction, while pollinators maintain plant diversity by spreading their genes around. These animal-plant relationships ensure that successful reproduction happens across ecosystems. Examples include European honeybees pollinating almond orchards, rufous hummingbirds sustaining western wildflowers, and Egyptian fruit bats pollinating baobab trees. Without conservation efforts to protect these pollinators, many plant species and agricultural systems are going to collapse. Water purification represents another important ecological service. Wetlands naturally filter contaminants, forests prevent water pollution, and healthy ecosystems ensure that clean water for human and wildlife consumption is available. The Florida Everglades filter agricultural runoff, oyster reefs clean Chesapeake Bay, and peat bogs purify Scottish Highland watersheds. These ecosystem services would be prohibitively expensive, like ridiculously expensive to replace with technology. And that makes their conservation economically sensible as well as ecologically vital. Climate regulation is maybe the most globally significant ecological service. Forests absorb carbon dioxide, biodiversity stabilizes climate patterns, and ecosystems regulate atmospheric gases. The Amazon rainforest sequesters huge amounts of CO2, sphagnum moss holds carbon in bogs, and mangroves protect coastal carbon stocks. These systems provide natural climate solutions that complement technological approaches to addressing climate change. Nutrient cycling represents yet another ecological justification for conservation. Decomposers recycle organic matter, soil organisms maintain fertility, and biodiversity ensures nutrient availability. Earthworms aerate agricultural soils, dung beetles recycle savanna nutrients, and mycorrhizal fungi support forest health. These natural recycling systems maintain ecosystem productivity without requiring human intervention, technology, or economic investment. Disease regulation is often overlooked, but it is critically important. 
Diverse ecosystems naturally limit pathogens. Predators control disease vectors, and balanced ecosystems prevent outbreaks. Barn owls control rodent populations that might otherwise spread disease. Amphibians eat mosquitoes that can carry pathogens and coral reef diversity limits marine pathogens. When we disrupt these natural control systems, it leads to disease outbreaks with serious consequences for wildlife and humans alike. Ethical arguments for conservation are diverse and can include reference to the intrinsic or instrumental value of species. Intrinsic value, if you remember back to topic one, intrinsic value refers to the inherent worth of a species independent of its usefulness to humans. This perspective holds that species have worth regardless of human utility. All life deserves respect and preservation, and biodiversity has value independent of human benefits. Examples include snow leopards deserving protection simply because they exist, Sumatran rhinos having an inherent right to survive, and Amazon river dolphins having value beyond any human benefit that they provide. By contrast, Instrumental value refers to the worth of a species based on its usefulness or benefit to humans or ecosystems. This includes bees providing crop pollination services, mangrove forests protecting coastal communities from storms, elephants generating tourism revenue, the Pacific yew trees producing cancer-fighting compounds, wolves regulating prey populations, and vultures preventing diseases spread by consuming carcasses. These values represent the practical benefits that species provide. Understanding different ethical frameworks helps us develop conservation strategies that resonate with different stakeholders and communities. Ecocentric perspectives emphasize intrinsic value and the right of all species to exist. That's the bio rights that we studied back in topic one. Anthropocentric perspectives focus on instrumental values and benefits to humans. Indigenous perspectives often blend these approaches, seeing people as part of nature with responsibilities towards it. Religious frameworks might view species as divine creations deserving of our stewardship. Rights-based approaches can extend moral consideration to non-human species, while utilitarian approaches can evaluate conservation based on overall welfare outcomes. Social arguments might highlight the importance of ecosystem goods and services for human well-being. Ecosystem goods are tangible resources that are harvested from nature and contribute to human welfare. Examples include Amazon forests providing medicinal plants, the Indian Ocean fisheries feeding coastal communities, and bamboo supplying sustainable building materials. These goods directly support human livelihoods and cultural practices. Ecosystem services encompass processes or functions that are performed by natural systems that support human life and well-being. Wetlands reduce flooding in communities. Urban trees improve mental health. Coral reefs protect coastal infrastructure. These services aren't harvested directly, but they provide essential background functions that our human communities depend on. Additional social arguments for biodiversity include cultural and community benefits, as well as health and security. Baobab trees maintain cultural traditions, salmon runs sustain indigenous communities, and national parks provide recreation opportunities. Intact ecosystems reduce disease emergence, diverse forests prevent landslides, and green spaces improve urban air quality. All these benefits connect biodiversity to human social systems and our well-being. To summarize the arguments for species and habitat preservation, aesthetic arguments focus on beauty and inspiration derived from diverse species and habitats. Ecological arguments highlight how diverse habitats provide services like erosion control, pollination, and flood prevention. Economic arguments emphasize ecotourism, medicinal compounds, and genetic resources. Ethical arguments consider bio rights and obligations to future generations. Social arguments recognize that habitats provide homes, work, resources, and social cohesion for people, particularly indigenous communities. Now let's transition to examining conservation strategies. Species-based conservation tends to involve ex situ strategies, while habitat-based conservation tends to involve in situ strategies. These different approaches serve complementary purposes in biodiversity protection. Ex situ conservation refers to protecting species outside their natural habitats. Ex means out, like in exit, and exclude and extraneous. So ex situ is like out of the situation. This species-based approach is particularly valuable for critically endangered species whose habitats have been severely damaged or fragmented. The Svalbard Global Seed Vault in Norway exemplifies this approach because it stores plant genetic diversity at really low temperatures to create botanical backup systems that enable future restoration efforts and protect against extinction events even if some of those ecosystems are wiped out in the meantime.
Another example of ex situ conservation is the California Condor Captive Breeding Program. This approach enables conservationists to breed endangered species in controlled environments, to maintain genetic diversity carefully, to increase population numbers safely, and to prepare animals for eventual reintroduction to natural ecosystems. This also supports the recovery of wild populations. For some critically endangered species, these programs represent their, frankly, their last chance for survival. In situ conservation focuses on protecting species within their natural habitats. In situ translates to in the situation. This habitat-based approach maintains ecological relationships and evolutionary processes while benefiting many different species at the same time. Yellowstone National Park in the U.S. exemplifies this strategy because it conserves ecosystems within natural habitats. It restricts harmful human activities, it protects multiple species at the same time, and it maintains ecological relationships intact, and that allows the natural evolutionary processes to continue. Marine environments also benefit from in situ conservation. The Mafia Island Marine Protected Area in Tanzania demonstrates this approach by regulating fishing and resource extraction, creating underwater wildlife sanctuaries, and implementing zone based protection systems. This allows marine populations to recover naturally, and it supports sustainable fishing in nearby areas. This balances conservation with human needs. And if you ever get the opportunity to go to Mafia Island and swim with these whale sharks, I highly recommend it. It's wicked cool. Habitat conservation strategies protect species by conserving their natural environment. This might require either protection of wild areas or active management, and that depends on the specific context and the threats that are facing that ecosystem. The amount of protected land worldwide has increased dramatically over time. In 1900, about 125 years ago, only 0.03% of global land was protected. But by 2023, this figure has risen to 17.9%. That's almost a fifth of all of the world's land. This reflects growing awareness of the importance of habitat conservation for biodiversity protection. However, quantity doesn't always equal quality. Effective management is really important for these protected areas so that they can fulfill their purpose of conservation. Serengeti National Park in Tanzania exemplifies the wild area approach to habitat conservation. This huge protected area spans 14,750 square kilometers of savanna and it maintains complete ecosystem integrity with minimal human intervention. It features limited infrastructure development, big buffer zones around a large core, and significant distance from major urban areas to minimize human disturbance. This approach prioritizes natural processes over human accessibility. By contrast, the Florida Everglades Restoration Project represents an actively managed conservation area. Approximately 5,200 square kilometers in size, this ecosystem needs human intervention through canals and levees to control water flow. People use prescribed burning to maintain fire-dependent habitats, and then hunting and the removal of invasive species like the Burmese python, the reintroduction of native species, land acquisition to connect fragmented habitats, and programs that prevent agricultural runoff and pollution are all required to maintain this ecosystem. That's why it's called active management. Zealandia in New Zealand demonstrates a third approach, pest exclusion fencing to create eco-sanctuaries. This 25-hectare urban sanctuary near downtown Wellington is surrounded by almost 9 kilometers of predator-proof fencing that keeps 14 species of non-native mammals out. This allows endangered native birds like kiwi, takane, and hihi to thrive while demonstrating successful conservation in proximity to urban areas where people can access it and use it for education and building awareness. Effective conservation of biodiversity in nature reserves and national parks depends on understanding the biology of target species and the effect of conservation area size and shape. These design principles greatly influence the success of a conservation area. UNESCO Biosphere Reserves exemplify thoughtful conservation design with three distinct zones. The core zone permits no human activity in the natural ecosystem. It monitors environmental quality and sustainability, and it protects endangered species and habitats. Around the core zone, you have the buffer zone. The buffer zone allows research and educational activities, it permits controlled tourism and recreation, and it manages resources for sustainable production. And the third layer is the transition zone. The transition zone accommodates managed human activities and settlements, it supports ecosystem restoration, and it promotes community collaboration for sustainability. The success of a protected area is linked to its design. 
Protected area design principles include physical aspects of the area as well as its relationship with surrounding communities. Consider these things when evaluating how well a protected area conserves biodiversity. Size, bigger is better. Shape, rounder shapes reduce the edge effect. Fragmentation, intact reserves are better than those that are disrupted by roads and infrastructure. The number of reserves, because more is better than one, but one is better than none. Connections to other protected areas. This promotes interbreeding and genetic diversity. Management, which often includes funding, and human presence, because fewer people generally means fewer disruptions to natural processes, as well as community engagement, because the more surrounding communities stand to gain from a protected area, the more successful that protected area is going to be. Habitat fragmentation poses one of the greatest threats to conservation success. When habitats are divided, interior spaces decrease due to isolation. Edge species increase and alter the ecosystem balance. Roads divide populations and block migration paths, and overall biodiversity and ecosystem resilience decline. Fragmentation disrupts the relationships between species that share a habitat. When natural or human-led events cause a divide in the habitat, some species might become unable to survive because they've been separated from other species that they depend on or that they have a relationship with. This diminishes biodiversity and ecosystem function, and it makes the remaining species more vulnerable or more susceptible to disease and environmental change. Conservation strategies have to address this kind of interconnection in order to be effective. That's it for our video on conservation and regeneration strategies. In our next video, we're going to take a look at several case studies that demonstrate in situ and ex situ conservation strategies. And we're also going to go through an evaluation of several protected areas around the world. Until next time, happy learning.